Hi, Andrew Wolf here. In this video, I'm going to provide a brief introduction to hepatic physiology. And then in uh, future visi um, videos, I will talk about the actual function of, of the portal venous system. And then I'll talk about the, uh, the inner workings of the hepatic lobules, which are, um, which are the working units of the liver. Um, okay, so in this introductory video, I want to talk about sort of three main um, classes of functions of the liver. And the first class of functions is the processing of nutrients. So some of you may have heard of the liver described as an accessory organ to the GI tract. Well, that's because of its role in the processing of nutrients. Now I always, um, having worked with patients in hepatic failure, um, I sort of chuckle when I hear people call the uh, liver a uh, accessory organ to the uh, to the gastrointestinal system because uh, the ramifications of a failing liver go way beyond the gastrointestinal system. And when we talk about the other two functions, you'll understand um, you'll understand this as well. It's not an accessory organ. Now, you know, an accessory organ would be like the spleen could be an accessory organ to the hematologic system. And, you know, you, I, I would be fine with the term accessory there because you can live without a spleen. You can't live without the liver. Okay, so processing of nutrients. Um, there are, you know, three main classes of nutrients. There are carbohydrates and the liver is involved in, in processing carbohydrates in um, sort of mediating the balance between glycogenesis and storage and gluconeogenesis. Now um, and th this is also, you know, be connected with glycogenolysis, right? This is, this is the creation of glycogen, this is the breakdown of glycogen in order to make glucose. Now, this is all sort of mediated by insulin and glucagon. So, if you think about um, when we are in a state where where we are making glycogen we have a lot of insulin and not very much glucagon so when does this happen well this happens right after a big meal right so you have a big meal your portal vein is um, is packed filled with carbohydrates and the pancreas has also been stimulated by the presence of uh, glucose in the GI tract to uh, to produce insulin and, um, and glucagon production at the same time glucagon um, excretion at the same time is being suppressed so we have more insulin um, less glucagon and lots of glucose available to the liver so the liver produces glycogen now glycogen is perfectly suited, suited for storage because it's insoluble. So it's an insoluble form of a simple um, of a simple carbohydrate, and um, so it is stored in the liver. It is very bad for transport in the bloodstream because in order to be transported in the bloodstream, uh, it's easiest to be transported in the bloodstream, I should say if um, you have a soluble molecule. So what's a soluble molecule? Glucose. So glucose is for transport, glycogen is for storage. So um, when there is lots of insulin, the liver is in storage mode and it's producing glycogen for storage. When there is very little insulin or the insulin glucagon balance is tipped in this direction, this would be sort of in fasting mode, um, then we are going to begin the process of glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis so we can send, um, so we can start cranking out glucose to be transported in the bloodstream. 
Now, I just want to make the point here that the liver is not the only place in the body that can um, engage in glycogenesis or gluconeogenesis. This can also occur in the brain and the muscles and some other tissues as well. Uh, the, the kidney actually is a very important um, organ that's also involved. But the liver, you know, has a very significant function here. Okay, so what other nutrients? Processing of nutrients. Now, the, the next, you know, the other two nu big nutrients groups are obviously proteins and lipids. So, the GI tract has digested and broken down proteins into amino acids. Now, the liver um, sort of puts them back together into pieces, and some of these are functional proteins, and some of these are sort of pre... are... are um, sort of pre-hormones and other um, pieces of proteins that are going to be built further... Uh, built up further in other cells. Um, so, the liver sort of takes the the raw product of amino acids and either makes it into a functional protein or um, makes it into you know a um, piece of a protein that's not functional yet but will be made functional in other organs and so when we start talking about the functional proteins we're um, we're actually moving into another area of what's sort of considered another area of um, hepatic function and that is considered the synthetic function. And we'll talk about that more later. So there's some sort of blurring of boundaries here when we get to talking about the processing of proteins. Um, with lipids, the liver has a very important role. Now, interestingly enough, all of the water-soluble nutrients that includes carbohydrates and proteins, um, are absorbed into the bloodstream, into the portal system, and go directly to the liver. The lipids, on the other hand, um, are not absorbed into the bloodstream. They are actually carried by, um, they're actually packaged into chylomicrons, and they're sort of too big to get absorbed into the bloodstream, so they end up draining through, through the lymphatic system. And in the lymphatic system, they drain in, um, into the thoracic duct. So they work their way up through the chest and drain into the thoracic duct um, up in the uh, left subclavian vein. So that's how they get into the, um, into the circulation. And then they make their way to the liver uh, via the bloodstream. So once they get to the liver, the liver processes um, can actually sort of take these chylomicrons and break them down and make them into triglycerides and cholesterols. And then, you know, so we have a difficulty um, circulating triglycerides through our bloodstream because they're insoluble. So the liver also has a significant role in in producing lipoproteins that can um, can reversibly blind, bind with these triglycerides and transport them around the bloodstream and that's how you get the you know you get the very low density lipoproteins the low density lipoproteins and then the high density lipoproteins and these are all um, involved in transport of triglycerides in various stages. And I'm not going to get into that um, that discussion right now. Um, and then also the liver is involved with the storage of some vitamins and minerals. Okay, so that is the uh, first function of the liver, the processing of nutrients. 
So the second one is the synthetic function, and I'll just put in the third one here while I'm talking about it. So we have number one, processing of nutrients. Number two, synthetic function, synthesis. And number three would be uh, protection and clearance. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the synthetic function. So follow me down to a fresh spot on the screen here, and we'll talk about the synthetic function of the liver. Now this is where things start to get very interesting, particularly when we start talking about the pathophysiology of the liver. When you start to lose, when you start to have derangements in the synthetic function, it causes all sorts of systemic problems because this is a very important function that's central to our functioning as an organism. Now remember when we talked about the hematologic system, we talked about how the blood has a lot of proteins and the proteins are very important to the, um, to the function of the circulatory system because they um, they have they produce what's called oncotic pressure that um, that enables blood to flow back into the capillaries to get pulled back into the capillaries on the venous end. So albumin is very important to the function of the um, circulatory system, and it also has carrier roles and things like that. In in the bloodstream, about 70% of all proteins are albumin. Um, the next important group of proteins are coagulation factors. Now not all coagulation factors are produced in the liver, but a number of very important ones are. And obviously the most important of all is fibrinogen, which is produced in the liver. And then um, a lot of the uh, most of the vitamin K dependent factors are also produced in the liver and that would, you know, for example, that would include uh, prothrombin, uh, factor 7, uh, factor 10 of course, another very uh, sort of central factor, and factor 9, to name a few. So really, you know, I, I would say, you know, I haven't counted them, but I would say the majority of clotting factors are produced in the liver and without the synthetic function of the liver the blood cannot clot effectively. So it has a you know the liver is is central in synthesis of coagulation factor. Now another group of important proteins would be transport and binding proteins. And, you know, just get to, to give an example of some proteins that we have talked about before, when we talked about the hematologic system with the iron cycle, we talked about the importance of a binding protein called apoferritin, which, um, when, um, when it's bound with iron, becomes ferritin, which um, allows for the storage of, of iron in the body. And then a similar one, is transferrin that allows for the transport of iron in the body. And then we have immunologic proteins. And that includes all of the complement proteins and many of the proteins in the um, in the uh, kinin calocrine system. So if you can imagine if you lose synthetic function of the liver, um, which interesting, I'll talk about, I'll make a slide talking about um, about the liver function tests and the way that we measure synthetic loss of synthetic function in the liver if, with patients with liver disease is we look at prothrombin time. 
And it's not that prothrombin, it's not that prothrombin t is the only important um, protein that the liver makes. It's that it is a marker for loss of all of these. So if you have a patient that has significant, with liver failure that has significant, a significantly elevated INR, you can also expect that they're going to have impaired albumin, they're going to have issues with transport and binding proteins, and they're going to have loss of immunologic proteins. So they're going to be essentially immunosuppressed, right? So keep that in mind that, that um, we don't measure PT, PT in patients with hepatic failure just because we're concerned about their bleeding we are looking at it as a marker for all of the synthetic function of the liver okay so what else does the liver synthesize well one other factor that it synthesizes is bile salts and when I talk about bile salts that's separate with the con conjugation of bilirubin is is really not part of the synthetic function but the creation of bile salts is and bile salts are um, are emulsifiers that are produced in the hepatocytes and move um, down actually and, and actually part of the synthesis is, is assisted by the cholangiocytes and the bile salts um, move through the bile canaliculi and into the uh, bile ducts down into the gallbladder and then are excreted into the small intestines um, in response to um, cholecystokinin um, and the cholecystokinin obviously is is a hormone that is um, secreted when there is high fat concentrations in the small bowel, and so the bile duct the bile duct is, secre uh, is secreting these bile salts and they're fat emulsifiers, so they sort of break up big globules of fat into a uh, suspension of fat, so that um, so that they can be the fats can be more easily absorbed in the GI tract. Okay, so moving back up to the top here. So we've talked about um, two elements. We've talked about the processing of nutrients, including proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and we've talked about synthetic function of the liver. Now, uh, the third thing that I want to talk about is the um, role of protection of the liver in protection and clearance. Now, we haven't talked about the portal vein yet, but I know most of you, when I talk about it, a lot of it's going to be review. The portal vein is the vein that's draining uh, the entire GI system, including the colon and the small bowel and the stomach and the distal part of the esophagus, etc. So if you think about that, the GI tract is full, particularly the colon, is full of bacteria. So, and, you know, the gut is pretty good at keeping bacteria out of the blood, but it's not perfect. Every once in a while, some slip through. Um, so the liver has a very important role in preventing bacteremia through from enteric bacteria. Uh, this is a picture of portal circulation here, portal vein going to the liver. So um, it has a very central role in uh, the protection and clearance of bacteria. So here I'm going to sort of... So the first thing is enteric, the protection from enteric bacteria. And so how does it do this? Well. The portal vein drains through what are called sinusoids, and I'll talk about this when, we, when I get into talking about the lobules of the liver. And the sinu sinusoids are just specialized capillaries of the liver. And these sinusoids are lined with Kupfer cells. And Kupfer cells are very active, potent, um, macrophages.
and in fact there are many many of them such that you know they make up a significant when you if you weigh the liver by cell they make up a significant portion of these cells they'd probably make up about 10 percent of all cells in the liver by weight so these are a significant part of the liver okay and then next we have the breakdown of toxins and those of you who have been in clinical practice and or taken pharmacology course courses you know that the liver plays in a, a very central role in breaking in the uh, metabolism of medications and other toxins in the liver and it has various ways of doing this it it has um, it can oxidize them it can cleave proteins and break them in half so they're no longer functional um, and also you know one of the toxins that uh, is in our body are sort of amino acids themselves um, amino acids can can be damaging to the body so the liver sort of deals with free amino acids by running them through the urea cycle and breaking them down into urea which is something that's not harmful until it gets into really high concentrations and um, but this is easily excreted um, in the kid via the kid and actually one of the breakdown products in of amino acids and this, this can occur either in our cells or in the gut itself um, we can have ammonia I develop high levels of ammonia and the liver runs this through a, a uh, urea cycle and breaks it down into urea as well um, so an ammonia at high levels can be toxic to the body as well now interestingly enough since one of the central um, ways that the body breaks down toxins is by oxidizing them remember oxidation via free radicals can um, damage and break down proteins so obviously it can directly damage important proteins in the body and it also can damage DNA so the liver uses oxidation to break down toxins but it also needs to protect itself from oxidation and so it produces antioxidants one of the most important ones in the body and that's produced by the liver is glutathione so the production of of antioxidants is another important uh, protective function of the liver and glutathione is really the major one So if, if the liver loses its ability to produce glutathione or its glutathione stores are broken down um, or worn down too much because of too much oxidation, then, um, then the body is open to damage from oxidative stress. And actually this is the major pathophysiology of acetaminophen overdose. really is due to um, a um, depletion, a rapid depletion of glutathione stores and um, the liver becomes very prone to oxidative damage and that can start to spread to other areas of the body as well. Okay, so that brings me to, to the end of my introduction to hepatic physiology and the three major functions of, of nutrient processing, the synthetic function and protective and clearance functions of the liver. Um, please join me in my next video. I will talk about uh, the portal venous drainage system and then um, in my third video about the liver lobule. Um, I'll talk about the liver sinusoids and the hepatocytes and uh, we'll get right down into the function of each cell. And as always, please take a moment to um, provide feedback by giving a thumbs up. And um, I'll, I'm willing to answer questions if you want to put them in the comments. And you can click here if you want um, quick and easy access to my other uh, GI tract videos. Thank you. I'll see you in, in later videos.